Thank you, Brendan, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a great pleasure to be back in the Institute. It's uh, home from home at this stage. And um, as Brendan has said, uh, 2014 is a year of political transition in the European Union, with a new commission coming into office, with um, at least half of the members of the European Parliament not standing again for election, and with a new president of the European Council to be selected. So. I thought I would frame my uh, remarks to you today around uh, what challenges will be on the desks of the incoming uh, team across the institutions as they take up their new roles uh, in, later in 2014. Um, but I want to say that I start out the year um, uh, optimistically. I think we should give ourselves the credit for the fact that the union stuck together in five years of the most difficult economic and financial crisis that uh, Europe has experienced uh, since, its since the foundation of the Union. Uh, the Euro did not collapse, despite all the predictions of very learned commentators, and Greece was not forced out of the Euro. And recovery is now underway, even if it's still fragile, and countries have started to exit programmes, showing that uh, a combination of policy and solidarity do work. So I think these are all important reasons to be optimistic. It would be tempting fate, I think, to say that the worst is behind us, especially when that growth is still fragile and when unemployment levels are, are unacceptably high. But I think the EU has shown that it can rise to the challenge, uh, particularly when the challenge is existential. And Maybe what we have decided is too little and too late for some commentators, but they always compare the union response time to the response time of a single country. And I think, in fact, that 28 countries have managed to take such far-reaching and huge decisions together is quite an achievement. So that's why I believe that the union is now in much better shape and much better equipped to face uh, the challenges of the future. Of course, this doesn't mean that things are going to be easy or that we'll never have problems again. And that's why um, I want to look now at the political, the economic, and a few other challenges that will be um, on the desks of the new leadership as they take up um, their roles. First of all, starting with the political, the European elections in late May across Europe. Um, the question everybody is trying to think about is how well will the Eurosceptics do? Will the extremes on the left and the right uh, do very well? I think, if you look at the opinion polls, it's likely that the results will be um, uncomfortable for uh, the mainstream uh, European um, thinking and European political parties. And we can already see that in some parts of the Union the debate is taking on a very nasty populist and even xenophobic flavour. Um, but I think we have to hope and we have to work to make sure that um, then the centre mainstream pro-European parties work more closely together in the next parliament um, and that they form a sort of grand coalition, at least on the big European issues. The outcome of the elections, as seen from today anyway, is likely to make the parliament a bit more unpredictable, a bit more difficult to work with. But as I say, I think um, it, that could also then lead to more of a coalition approach uh, on the main issues. But in the end, we have to wait for the votes to be counted. Uh, reading the tea leaves um, is very interesting. Uh, but until the votes are counted, we, we can't really draw any conclusions. In the Commission, ensuring a smooth transition from one Commission to the next is also going to be a challenge. Now, 10 years ago, the incoming Commission had to adjust to being a much bigger, um, now having 28 Commissioners and to the implementation a few years later of the Lisbon Treaty, which brought us um, a permanent president of the European Council, a permanent high representative, has changed a lot of the way in which um, uh, the institutions work in Brussels. So we, we have bedded down those innovations now and have developed ways of working. And one of the challenges um, for a new commission president is going to be how to organise that college of commissioners to deliver on whatever priorities the next president is going to set. But um, another equal challenge will be for that new president to forge extremely close working relations with the president of the European Council, with the new president of the European Parliament, and with the high representative. And I would hope that we can um, build... Um, an interinstitutional way of working, at least on the key, uh, the key policy issues, so that they can work more cooperatively to drive the agenda forward. 
So, um, because their task is going to be to help the EU shape its post-crisis policies. The world has changed uh, in so many ways since the crisis. And so, um, while there will be, of course, a high degree of continuity, we also have to revisit a lot of policies um, building on the foundations that were put in place during the crisis, but now to shape a new generation of growth and employment policies in particular for uh, the post-crisis area. And so that brings me to, I think, what will be one of the central day-to-day -day challenges for the new teams. That will be how to sustain the economic recovery. Um, even pre-crisis, Europe had difficulties with um, uh, growth. We had and still have lower levels of productivity. We are an ageing society. We are resource poor. Uh, we can deal with all these challenges, but we have to um, put the political will together with the technical capacity to deal with them. Uh, so I think the big challenge on the desk of our new leadership is going to be how can we restore the prosperity triangle in Europe of stability, growth and equity cohesion? And I think um, this question of equity and cohesion is going to be high on the political agenda. We all know that many, many people are, have been left feeling um, that what <coughs> happened in the crisis was unfair. Um, and we can see the gaps in our society and on our continent growing rather than reducing. So dealing with this, turning this situation around, which had been one of the big successes of the European Union, was a gradually more equal uh, society, um, is going to be part of the future policy change because new policies will not be accepted unless there is buy-in from the population. So this is um, part of the framework, the, the thinking that the new leadership will have to go through. And I want to highlight in the economic area just three of the many points that I could, could choose. The first one is financial stability. Um, I think that good foundations have been laid in the last five years. When the crisis hit, we didn't have all the policy instruments that we needed, but we have been putting them in place. And the EU has done a lot to overhaul the financial sector. Almost all of the uh, legislation to revamp the financial sector is now adopted or close to being adopted. Um, we have put a new supervisory system in place to try to prevent future problems. Um, we, have, we are close to getting the banking union in place. I think the single most important thing that has to be done before the European Parliament goes to the election campaign is to find an agreement with the Council on the Single Resolution Mechanism. We need to have the banking union in place um, as part of the credibility of the euro, but also for the public credibility of being able to say to people that um, the taxpayer will not be asked again to bail out the banks uh, if and when there are problems in the banking sector in the future. So I think uh, a lot has been done uh, to, to put things right. But I think we also have to look at moving away from what in Europe is a very bank-centric um, means of uh, financing model. We need to develop um, deeper capital markets, all different new modern kinds of way of raising capital. <laughs> and we also need to get the banks lending again. Um, more responsibly, but lending again. Um, I was very struck by some figures from the ECB, which are for the second half of 2012, but I think they tell a story of what's happening in Europe at the moment. 85% of German small and medium-sized companies applying for credit got the full amount they asked for. In Southern Europe, only 42%, and in Greece, only 25%. And even more worrying, a lot of SMEs didn't even apply because they were afraid of being rejected. So we don't have the same situation everywhere across Europe, but in large parts of Europe, we have a real problem uh, of financing the economy. And so my second point um, on the growing pile on the desk in front of the new leadership will be, what are we going to do about investment? How can we get investment um, levels up again in Europe? It's very worrying that even in the countries that didn't have anything like the same uh, problems as, as Ireland did during the crisis, public investment in public goods has not been maintained. And we have a lot of um, cash-rich companies which are keeping their cash because they don't have the confidence to invest. Um, and this is not only about the volume of investment, it's also about the quality of investment. When you look at the challenges that Europe will have to tackle in the future about closing the skills gap, about um, revamping the education system, about doing better in research and innovation, all of these questions are as much about the quality of investment, uh, but you also have to have a quantity of investment. 
Um, investing in young people and in the unemployed is going to um, be something that has to be on the agenda for several years to come to bring down those unacceptably high levels of unemployment. We are, in the Commission, we are very grateful to the Irish Presidency last year because they supported and got agreement on the youth guarantee to give um, all young people under 25 who were not in full-time education or employment the chance to, to be involved in, in education training or in work. Um, and it's important now to, to turn that guarantee into reality, uh, particularly in the, in the countries and the regions where levels of youth unemployment are so high. And that leads me to then my third economic challenge, which is um, how to continue deepening economic and monetary union. I said that we didn't have all the instruments that we needed when the crisis struck. Um, there are still things that we need to do, to do better together um, in order to make sure that we um, have a stronger euro area in the future. And um, it is a little bit worrying, I think, to see that um, as, the, as the economy improves, the appetite for uh, doing more together, for balancing uh, responsibility and solidarity is going down. So we have to hope that the member states have drawn the right conclusions from the crisis, that, that they uh, are determined not to go back to the bad old days, um, but hoping that is not enough. So I think putting in place things like the, the Fiscal Compact Treaty that uh, requires member states to have independent budgetary authorities, to have uh, legally binding debt levels in, in the legal order. These kind of things are, are important ways of um, trying to safeguard against a return to the bad old days. Um, but we, we will have more work to do to make sure that governments do follow through on putting money aside in the good times, to have a buffer for the bad times, um, and to get member states to work together so that they take account of the impact on each other of their policies. When you're locked together in a currency union, the, the effect of positive and negative spillovers is, is much more important than when you're not in a common currency union. So <clears throat> I think we have to work much harder to have national ownership of what has now been decided at, at EU level. And I was talking yesterday to the Oireachtas European Affairs Committee on this subject about the European semester, about the annual growth survey, and I must say, I found that they were um, very up to speed, very interested in it, wanting to play the role that national parliaments have to play as part of this process. Because this should not be a process where the Commission is the schoolmaster handing out the report cards to the member states, um, who then try to explain to their parents that um, you know, a B- minus isn't really a bad result. Um, that will never work. It simply is not feasible. So we have to have a situation where these issues are discussed domestically, and where, um, where we can have an open debate about what the Commission sees as problems drawing from our analysis, our knowledge of the countries. And then if the country doesn't agree to have a debate about are we wrong, are they wrong, uh, are there different ways of achieving the results, but we have to keep this um, shared way of doing uh, economic policy in the future. Um, and I think uh, there is more work to be done to have a more mature understanding um, at national uh, level and where the national and the European level meets about the, the constraints of a currency union, the opportunities of a currency union, but the need to build public acceptance for the fact that um, we are in this together and that means uh, taking responsibility for deciding together. Um, leaving the economic area, I'd like to move on a little bit to um, the wider debate on Europe. Um, I think that the whole debate on, on economic governance, combined with the fact that the UK is very clear that it does not want to come on the journey of deeper integration that is essential for the euro uh, to, to, to be a strong currency area, is going to bring another discussion in the coming years on what kind of Europe do we want, um, what do we want Europe to do, what do we not want Europe to do. I think that... The crisis obviously brought, and Ireland is a case in point, brought a feeling of intrusion into uh, areas that were previously very domestic, and in particular that people in the national space felt a bit squeezed because they weren't taking all the decisions on their own anymore. And I think that this is going to be part of the debate about not only what the, we do together at European level, but also how we do it. 
Um, we have been working for some time in the Commission on what we call the Better Regulation Agenda to try to review what we have on the statute book, to update it, to streamline it, to strip it out, to have a lighter impact. And this is coming together with a debate on um, subsidiarity uh, across, which is becoming a mainstream debate now. Um, and there are, we have been there before, we have a protocol in the Lisbon Treaty that governs um, subsidiarity. But I think we will have a new role, or a new round of debate, including on the prescriptiveness and the intensity of EU involvement. And uh, can that, is that something that can be adjusted rather than a dismantling of what we have or a rolling back of what we have, but a, a new discussion for a new generation about exactly uh, how does Europe do, do what it does. And I think it's a good topic for debate. I think it will bring to the fore um, the question of how far are member states prepared to trust each other to deliver things that are generally expressed, or do they not trust each other and do they want to write down in excruciating detail what will happen at every stage? We have to have a debate about these kind of things. Um, I think that this will also bring up questions relating to the capacity of different public administrations around Europe. And it's one reason why in our annual growth survey for the last several years, we have put modernizing uh, public administration as one of the five priorities because we live in a very sophisticated world. What we do at European level is very complex. We need to have a government machinery behind um, that to be able to deliver uh, on these policies. And so at times of squeezing the public sector, cutbacks in the public sector, uh, we need to, to invest in, in the capacity of a union that functions as a, uh, on, on the basis of legal framework to be able to roll out all of those agreed policies in similar ways across 28 rather different countries. Um, another point I want to make is that um, inevitably during the crisis, Europe was very inward looking. Um, we were completely consumed by the crisis. Um, at the top political level, uh, the European Council was meeting once a month uh, because it was in crisis mode. And I think we now, um, coming out of this crisis, we have to re-establish Europe's outward look and Europe's place in the world. And we need to return to themes that we were discussing five or six years ago about globalization and how can Europe shape it. Um, we can see export-led recovery in a number of member states, so clearly showing that Europe's connection to the outside world is very beneficial for us. Um, and that's why we have some very big trade negotiations on the agenda at the moment. Of course, the one um, that the biggest prize of all would be the uh, free trade agreement with the United States. We are warming up on the negotiations on that, um, and that will, will take quite a lot of detailed negotiation to, to see whether both sides of the Atlantic are prepared to commit to a new way of working. But the prize of doing that is very, very, very big. Um, I think um, uh, issues like energy and climate change are, are certainly going to be on the international agenda as well. You um, have seen that the Commission this week has uh, put out its new energy and climate package, drawing on the experience of the last six or seven years. Some things worked well, some things did not work so well. It's foolish not to um, adjust the policy when the evidence tells you that you need to make adjustments. But um, part of uh, what the Commission um, has proposed is for a very ambitious target for the Union by 2020 to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 40%. Um, and that is, would be what we would want Europe to take to next year's international climate negotiations as our position. So in all of these ways, Europe has to get back and engage with the rest of the world, just as there are issues that we can tackle better together at European level rather than nationally, Europe is also a limiting factor in itself when you're dealing with global challenges. So we need to get back in the game because the world has changed and some of the the European ways of doing things are no longer um, accepted by our partners. Europe traditionally is very much in favour of multinational binding international treaties as a way of doing things. It's a kind of wider projection of the way that we work internally. But a lot of big players around the world don't want to do that. We shouldn't just throw our hands up and say, oh, you know, we can't get the treaties through anymore. We have to find other ways of engaging with different partners to solve these international <coughs> problems. And for that, you have to be freed up from the intensity of the domestic focus that, that everybody has had for the last few years. 
I want to mention one uh, more topic uh, before I come to saying just a few things about Ireland in, in this context of change in 2014, and it is the issue of migration. Um, there's a very difficult debate coming. Um, we see our demography, we see the skills gaps. Uh, Europe will need uh, to find some way of having intelligent, managed migration. Um, there will be continuing pressure from our neighbourhood. Uh, look at what's going on in the Middle East. Look at the human tragedy there. There will be pressure uh, from refugees. There is also Europe will have a need to bring in skilled labour from outside. And the debate is, is actually very ill-informed. We've just had several weeks of intensive media debate about free movement inside the European Union. That is one of the fundamental principles of the Union, and we must defend it. We can't have second-class uh, member states. If you join, it has to be as full members. Um, and so the Commission will, will defend the right of free movement. But it doesn't mean that we don't have to look again at some of the rules that, uh, that pertain to all of this. So there is a need for a debate, which is going to be a very difficult one. It's going to cross many different policy areas, many different ministries. So inevitably, um, the European Council is going to have to, to help uh, steer uh, an intelligent orientation for Europe in the years to come on, on an issue like that. So um, I won't go on about um, the, grad the growing list that will be on the desks of uh, the new leadership, but these are just some of the, the big issues that they will have to tackle um, very early um, in their new mandates because five years goes by very quickly and uh, you need to be quick out of the starting blocks in order to achieve um, results in five years. Um, so uh, I think that a lot of, of preparation is going on now so that we can hopefully help the new leadership um, uh, be up and running very quickly. Thinking about Ireland, um, I, I definitely think that Ireland had a, a good EU year last year, a very successful presidency. I mean, I think uh, the, the ministers and officials who, who, who were involved in running it really did do a very good uh, public relations job for Ireland by showing what a very determined, focused team can do. Um, I remember a few of my colleagues saying, oh my God, it's very different. We get homework before we go to the meetings. We have to perform at the meetings and we have homework to do afterwards. <laughs> so it was a really well organised um, and very, very uh, streamlined uh, presidency. And um, I know that everybody in it felt that um, you know, they were doing their bit for putting uh, a different image of Ireland back on, on the European agenda. And I think they really succeeded. And then, of course, coming out of the programme at the end of the year was also a badge of honour. And uh, it's something that uh, we are very proud of as well, because um, we recognise um, how tough it was, how difficult it was, what people have gone through. But it was also uh, a very important exercise in European solidarity to come to the help of a member state in difficulty. And sometimes it's tough love, um, you know, when you have to uh, recommend policies that are difficult to implement. But I think it was a success of working together. And um, so for Ireland for 2014, uh, it should be a, a year of back to normal, um, not being a special member state uh, under a special regime, but being a normal member state playing its full role um, in the whole proceedings. And I won't go into details now, but we can develop this in the questions and answers. That means that Ireland will be in what we call the European semester. So um, fully part of sharing policy making, getting recommendations from the Commission, because there are still structural reforms to be done here, <coughs> even after the programme has ended. Um, but this will be all part of the normal process in which um, all member states are engaged. Um, and I think... Um, uh, it's an area where Ireland can actually play uh, a role beyond its size in helping to shape um, Europe's post-crisis growth strategy because of what, we, what um, people have come through here. And we will be um, reviewing what is called Europe 2020. It's Europe's uh, growth and job strategy. We will be reviewing that this year. We will have a big public consultation. So I hope lots of people in this room and the organisations that you represent will participate in that. I think we need a real discussion about what kind of uh, strategy should we have uh, as we come out of the crisis. And then it will be for the new Commission, the new Parliament and the new uh, European Council uh, President to, to, to lead that to agreement um, across the floor. <coughs> so um, uh, I think that um, you, 20, by the end of 2014, 
uh, the faces that we all uh, recognise as the European leadership will be very different. We'll all have to get used to working with some people we know, some people we don't necessarily know, but um, the, the, the photographs of the family photographs of the different meetings will look very different uh, from what they look at the moment. And it's a, the timing is good for once because coming out of a crisis, new team, good foundations having been put in place by, by those who are just completing their mandates now, it really is an opportunity for uh, a new beginning. And um, I think that uh, they will have to build on the, on the, the foundations, to build a new narrative on the foundations that they will inherit. Um, so post the European elections and post the UK elections the following <coughs> year, there will have to be a real debate on the European projects. Um, a lot of people across Europe will be asking some of the, prob the questions that people here are asking about where do we go from here now that we're out of the crisis, where next? Um, and I think that we can sit down and... Uh, uh, debate this together and then decide what are we going to agree to do together at European level, what are we going to agree that we're not going to do together at European level. And I think that we will, of course, have to find a compromise between very different starting points. Uh, but what's fascinating about the European Union is uh, when, they, they come to, when people come together, they start with very different starting points, but somehow or other... Um, we manage to hammer out uh, a way forward uh, for the future. And the union is its not static. It's always changing and evolving. And we're on a journey that doesn't have a fixed end point. That frustrates some because they don't want to sign up until they know exactly what's the destination. But I think for most of the countries, there is an understanding that this is the best vehicle we have, despite all its flaws and its frustrating aspects. This is the best vehicle we have for making common cause and for, for delivering um, a better results for, for our fellow citizens in the future. And for me, that's what will make the European Union continue to be relevant um, in the years to come, is that adaptability and flexibility and ability out of very different starting points to find a common way forward. So maybe I'll pause there, Chairman, and, uh, and we can see what's on the minds of the audience. Thank you very Thank you. much.